Hello everybody and welcome to Woobercast. This is episode 25 for November the 14th, 2016. As always, I'm your host, Joe Yates. We're back. Yep, the show is finally back. Um, I've had to take pretty, sort of an extensive, well, a two-week hiatus, actually. Uh, just due to me getting a job and stuff like this. And also me, you know, preparing for Liverpool myself. Um, not having enough time just to sit down and record some videos. So apologies about that, but we are back now. I will start the regular schedule back up and stuff like that. Uh, and yeah, we're all ready to go again. So, this week, what's on the agenda? I'm going to be talking about my experience at Liverpool Regionals, um, and really just recapping the tournament as a whole, and talking about what did well and what didn't do well. So first of all, for those of you not in the know, Liverpool Regionals happened last weekend, uh, on in Liverpool, of course. It was a standard format tournament. I believe there were 270-something Masters. It was something like that. It was enough for us to have a day two with a top 32, and of course, for some bizarre reason, we did not have a day two with top 32. We just went straight to top eight with like 276 masters, which is just an absurdly difficult cut to have to make. So, and I think it did greatly affect the results of what uh, showed up on the day, which I'll get into a bit later on in the video. But for now, yeah, it was kind of sucky. We only found out at the last minute as well that it was just going to be straight up to top eight, uh, which is kind of fortunate because I came like this close to playing Houndoom Mill. Houndoom Mill could not make top eight. Top 32, I could make that with Houndoom. I could not make a top eight. Um, <laughs> so I'm kind of glad I didn't play that. I didn't make top 32 anyway, so it was a moot point. Uh, I personally played Rainbow Road. Rory, of course, as well played Rainbow Road. Um, from uh, from the Irish team, we had Alan playing uh, Evil Tall Stuff. It was like Evil Tall. I don't know if he played Mew in the end. It might have just been Evil Tall Garbodor. There was, uh, let's see, Mike with Dark Tina. Keen also played Rainbow Road. Did the best out of all of us, going four wins and five draws. Uh, so GG Keen didn't lose a single game. Well done, man. At his first major tournament as well. That's pretty cool. We all... Uh, um, but yeah, that was our best performance of the day. We didn't have a good tournament. We we did not have a good tournament at all. Oshin as well played Mega Mewtwo. I just want to give a shout out to everyone who did come over and play the weekend with us because it was fun. Uh, even if we did do kind of bad. Shout out to Rory though who did come second in the League Cup the day after playing Rainbow Road with a tweaked list from the first day. So, anyway, I played Rainbow Road. What did I learn about the deck? Wasn't a huge fan of it. I think it's a great deck. I think it's a sort of flawed concept though in that it's extremely based on your own consistency and it's very easy to draw dead with rainbow road for example i played against a volcanian um which should be a really easy matchup for me uh not really easy but like a very winnable and a very definitely a very doable matchup for me because you just hit such big numbers and volcanian can't keep up and it's not that easy to kill a xerneas with a baby volcanian especially if you've got a fury belt on your xerneas but i open game one with Joltik. And he dunks, and we go to game two, and I open with Joltik, and he dunks, and the whole thing's over in 60 seconds, and that's just my tournament d done right there, and there's nothing I can do about it. Which sucks, um, but what can you do? Espe like, even if there was, like, a top 32, I think at that point it was like, nah, I'm, I'm screwed now, I can't, I just lost. My mental capacity for the game just died at that point. I think I didn't enjoy playing it either, because I didn't build the list from the ground up myself. I kind of started off with, like, the stock, like list of Hoopas and then EXs and then from there I worked it out myself. Um, there were still a few things that I wasn't super sure of. I think I made some misplays with it on the day. I I'd learned I learned a lot about what I want to play for tournaments and I learned Rainbow Road is not one of those decks that I necessarily enjoy piloting but that's... what can you do about that? I think you have to enjoy the deck in order to do well with it. Or at least I do for sure. Yeah, the version I played had the... it was EXs with the 2-2 two -two Galvantula line. I also had one Gligar in there for laughs. Um, I, I did use... Just look up Gligar. I, I'm not even... It's like, flip a coin if heads you're paralyzed and poisoned for a colorless energy. Um, it was like it was either going to be that or safeguard carbon. And in testing, it actually ended up being way better. However, Rainbow Road did make top 8. Mehdi Haffy piloting it. I believe he's a French player. Yeah, French. His list did have a safeguard carbon in it, and I believe he said it was for the Vileplume box matchup, where you can just wall out with carbon. Um... So that they have to attack with Red Ice, and then you can come in with your Xerneas and Lissanda Pajolteon and take the KO that way, uh, which makes a lot more sense. I didn't play any Vile Plume Box in the day. In fact, I don't think I even tested against it because I didn't expect it to be popular enough, which is true. It's not a very popular deck, but those who do pilot it seem to do well. There was one in top 32, after all. Uh, the only other significant difference between his list and I think the lists that we were looking at, the ones we were running, was he ran one Skyla, whereas we ran one Teammates. I really enjoyed using Teammates. I can definitely see where Skyla would be good, though. 
Uh, he also had a fourth max elixir. We did not. Something else that we all wanted on the day was the fourth max elixir because setting up Xerneas's out of nowhere is really, really good for very obvious reasons. So shout out to Medi. He obviously knew how to pilot it way better than we did. Yeah, it was, or at least way better than I did for damn sure. So anyway, he made top eight with that. Fair play to him. But what else made top eight? This is what I really, really wanted to talk about today is what else made top eight because it's actually a really interesting top eight split. Now, having said that, I do think this would have looked very different if we had a top 32, because looking at the top 32, there's a lot of Avelsal in there, there's a lot of Greninja, surprisingly, in there, there's a lot of Volcanion in there, uh, none of these made it into top 8. If we had had the top 32, and they had been able to compete against each other, I think these decks would have definitely shown up um, against in the actual top 8 then, but I digress, that's not how it panned out at all. Uh, Mega Mewtwo and Dark Tina, in case anyone was wondering, didn't feature that heavily at all. I believe there's only one Mega Mewtwo in top 32 and only one Dark Rytina as well. Um, I think people just countered for Mega Mewtwo. There was an awful lot of speed Mega Gardevoir. The Spare Ray Mega Gardevoir was just everywhere. Uh, and that made it a lot harder for Mewtwo to sort of fight its way out. On top of that, Mega Scizor was also quite present in at the top tables. Uh, which is difficult enough for Mewtwo because you can just sort of keep getting rid of the Shrine of Memories... Especially because all these scissor lists ran really high counts of Silent Lab. Uh, I'll get onto those in a minute, though. They're really cool, actually. Anyway, what did make top 8? Uh, what ended up winning it was Mega Rayquaza. So, this might catch some people by surprise. It might be... Um, I mean, yeah, it, it is a surprise. No one really expected Mega Rayquaza to do this well. It just wasn't a popular deck, and it wasn't seen as a good pick going into this tournament. Uh, because Parallel City was everywhere. But I think this this like moment was like the turning point at which people started dropping Parallel City. Uh, because looking at the list here, I can't see a lot of decks that are running Parallel City. Even the Mega Scizor lists, I believe, um, Luke's one, one, uh, they're supposed to run just four Silent Lab, and I believe one of them was like three Silent Lab, one Parallel, but other than that, it's just all Silent Labs. And, you know, that does hurt, Ray. Obviously, it means you can't Hoopa, you can't, your Magearna doesn't work, so your, the Scizor can still get the energy off. Um, but at least the Ray can still do a decent amount of damage. On top of that, it ran Magirna, which I think is the right call, because it does protect you from Scizor's attack if you can, you know, attach, like, drop a Skyfield and then start attacking, and the Scizor player can't counter. They have to just assume that you're gonna... They can't get rid of the double colorless energy is what I mean. On top of that, it also protects you from Mega Mewtwo damage swap if that ever comes up, which I don't think it will. Uh, other Jirachis, I doubt that came up on the day, but if it did, there you go. I think it's more like it's better than your other options, really. Also, against Mega Gardevoir, you can attack with it and take a one-hit KO. That's pretty great. Uh, Jirachi, I think, is a really cool idea to have in the Mega Ray list as well. This is something that... I am surprised it's not seeing more use than it is at the moment, since it's a really, really simple tech that helps out against a bunch of different matchups. So, like, against Giratina, just, there you go. Because a lot of Giratina lists aren't running uh, Magirna. I don't think any of them in the top 32 were running Magirna. And hey, well, there you go. Jirachi is just going to run through you as a result. It's just super, super easy to tech against it. And it's a, it's one card. It's one basic energy. I'm really surprised this hasn't been seeing more play than it actually has. Because in the matchups where it puts in work, it really puts in the work. Um, so I'm really glad to see that doing well. And I assume it means that more people will sort of pick up on it and try and counter it, I guess. I, I'm sure that card will be some sort of influence uh, into the metagame as well. So, yeah, like I said, it's played just as people were dropping up parallel, but it also, the cool thing about the list was he ran no Karen. Uh, by the way, this Cedric Guan, French player, um, shout out to him, he's the one who piloted this list. Uh, he ran no Karen, and also with the Mega Gardevoir lists that ran, like, you know, three Hoopa, two, four Shamans, and this kind of turbo stuff, uh, they didn't run Karen either, which... I think I think most of them didn't run Karen. Yeah, because let's see, I think a lot of them dropped Karen. Some of them were still trying to like net decking off of um, Maze Brennick Myers list, which is circulating around, which does run a Karen. Even though I believe he has said himself that it's the one card he would change to the list was he didn't want the Karen. So there you go. It's weird that people are you know we saw Karen as this like format the finding card when it came out and it's. Uh, as with a lot of these cards, like Special Charge and like, um, God, what else? Plenty of other cards that have come out we've all thought were going to be amazingly dominant. Um, it hasn't lived up to those expectations. Mega Alakazam, there's another great example. Uh, so that shouldn't surprise. I mean, 
yeah, in the decks that it should be played in, it's not being played, which is kind of weird. Brock as well is now out. Again, more competition for it. Uh, and Dragonite is only going to make Ra Rayquaza even better. Like, damn, we've been playing around with Dragonite in Turbo Guard of War, and that thing is stupid good. <laughs> just so stupid good. It's just, it's like Hoopa, but for a different part of your board. It's insane. We You already have Hoopa. Why do you need more on top of that? But you just get it anyway. It's like two buddy-buddy rescues at once. It's just stupid good. It's not even straight onto your bench, it's into your hand. So you can Dragonite for a Hoopa for a Dragonite and just keep going. Um, yeah, I really don't know why I slagged this thing off in our set review, to be honest. I highly regret that. Uh, now that we've played around with it a bit, it's just very, very good. And I think it's going to make Ray a bit, a lot better. Um, so, yeah, <clears throat> we're going to have to start probably countering for Ray. The other thing is, there wasn't a whole lot of Garbodor, actually, in the top 8 either. <clears throat> or in the field in general. Which is, um, I don't want to say surprising, because these are all those things like, the thing about Garbodor and Parallel City is, they dropped off in play going into this tournament, because it's the kind of thing you can't run it and then be like, if your opponent's running it, it's a useless card. So, it, it feels like, in the majority of your matchups, you'd be better off not having it at all, because that could be a different card that you would then want instead. And... You know, Ray comes in at this time where nobody's countering for Ray, and it just tears up the tournament. So, there you go. It's not a surprise when you think about it. It's just more like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Um, anyway, the other deck that made top eight, uh, the deck that came second was Mega Gardevoir. This is some like, I think no one should be surprised to see it here because <clears throat> I think anyone who was following like uh, the UK Pokemon scene we'll know that this was getting a lot of hype among top players, and we'll know that this was, like... Scene is definitely one of the stronger decks going into the tournament, so I don't think it should surprise anyone that it did so well. Uh, I definitely don't think it should be surprised at all. I feel like if anyone was planning on going into this tournament, planning on reaching, like, the number one spot, you would have had to play a list that could beat Gardevoir. And a lot of players did. A lot of players did tech for it, tech against it. Um, we, just, we, we see two Mega Scizors in top eight. Um out of a group of three people who came together with a list. So, there you go. It. I mean, you can just run into that matchup all day and have a great time. Which is really cool. So, I don't know. It's It shouldn't be a surprise at all. That's, this is the one I'm trying to make. Super consistent as well. And across, of course, a nine-round tournament with the top eight. That's what you want. You want something that's not going to draw dead. Um, Like my Rainbow Road list. Uh, oh, well. What can, what can you do? What can you do? I ran 3N and everything. I couldn't get the draws right. Um... On top of that, no Karen, like I said. I, I'm pretty sure it's Carl, Carl Blake was the man who came second with it. I do not know if he ran Karen or not. I'm pretty sure he got he just copied Maze's list. Um, and if he did, then he would have had Karen in it. I don't know if he used it throughout the tournament, and I can't see people keeping it in the list, especially with Dragonite coming out, unless they're super paranoid about Silent Lab. Um, but for now, that's what happened. Uh, a lot of the Guard of War lists that we actually saw in the League Cup afterwards were running um, a really interesting build with, like, no Skyfields and just a hell of a lot of Silent Lab to beat Giratina. <laughs> um, and probably other things as well, aside from Giratina. Just, you know, I think Silent Lab has actually become one of the best stadiums in the format. Even better than the Parallel City. And a lot of the new decks that I'm building and a lot of the decks that I'm uh, coming up with, which will be showcased on the channel very soon, I promise you, are running really high counts of Silent Lab. I have a crazy Mega Pidgeot list with like three Silent Lab that I definitely want to show off. That thing is so cool. Um, not, is it good? Potentially not, but I think you got to start. The thing about Pidgeot is, you know, you, it's not a very clear archetype from the outset. You got to work up to it. So anyway, that's me getting off onto a completely different track. But um, if people are running Gardevoir with high counts of Silent Lab in the future, they're not going to be running Dragonite, which means maybe they will choose Karen instead. So, these are all things that we need to think about. I think Dortmund Regionals is coming up very soon, and that will show us a lot more about what people decide to run. Um, and if people do decide to go for this crazy Silent Lab build instead. Only time will tell. The other Gardevoir that made top 8 was Mega Gardevoir Xerneas. The fairy one. Yeah, there is that Primal Clash one that we all sort of forgot about. This is a bit like Mega Ray. It got a lot of hype uh, in the very early parts of the format. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, we just sort of forgot about it for some reason. 
I kind of don't see why. It's still a solid deck. It can still hit ridiculous numbers. You're still setting up with like a high HP non-EX with a solid attack in itself with Geomancy and what's the other one? Rainbow Spear? That one, yeah. Xerneas Break as well obviously can hit big numbers. Um, as a non-EX counterpart to the Mega, I really... You can run one of the Despair Rays to give yourself an auto win against Mega Mewtwo. I really don't see why we haven't been talking about this one as much as we have been, but, well, now we kind of have to talk about it again, so... Shout out to Nindrich. I have... From the Czech Republic. I'm not familiar with this player, sorry, so I don't, I don't know your surname, but... Uh, shout out to that guy. Because we all just forgot about this. Um, I really honestly don't know enough about the deck to talk about it in any more detail, to be completely honest with you. Um, but no, it's cool to see it there. I think it's something we all should have been weary about, and we just sort of weren't. What else? Scizor. Two Scizors in top eight. This is... Okay, Luke Kirkham, Alex Stowe, and Tamar Cameron all made this list together. Uh, I was actually fortunate enough to play Tamao Day 2 in the League Cup uh, with with this Scizor list. I actually played Raichu Break in the League Cup. Uh, it was a really fun deck that I needed. I wanted to a lot of practice with it, so I was like, yeah, you know what, I'll bring this to the League Cup, see how it does. Um, it was a pretty cool deck. I'm going to work on it a bit more, I think. But he play, they all played this Scizor list, and it is a crazy, crazy list. They, I believe Tamao did a video on it on his channel. So I'm going to link that in the description. If you want to know more about this list, just go to that video because it's all, they cover it in a lot of detail uh, and go through it card by card and stuff like that. It's really good. Um, it plays like four Silent Lab and three red card. That, it, that alone is just terrifying and will just win you games. I did lose a game in the League Cup to some guy who was playing Scizor with four Silent Lab, four red card. Um, and he goes first and he plays Silent Lab and he red cards me and my hand was just like, two Pikachus and two Zoroks, and that was it. I, don't know. I was like, well, I lose. Um, so yeah, that's... I mean, you go first and you get that. That's a horrible combination to try and beat. So, you know, what can you do really against that? It's a really cool deck, and I think Scizor needed, needs a lot of help to be a top-tier contender. Because playing it with just the straight lists and stuff like that, I found myself really... I felt short on damage. I felt short on... Um, disruption, but I couldn't... I could get more damage, but then I'd be sacrificing the disruption. I couldn't really get a good balance between the two. This is ultimate disruption in terms of you're not even going to play energy because you're not even going to draw it. Also, ran a 1-1 goal bat line, which, as soon as I saw this, I was kicking myself, because I was like, why didn't I think of this? Because I played a decent amount of Scizor. I tried a bunch of, like, non-EX text to run in it. I was like, Kabalion's cool, what about Jinx, what about Mr. Mime, what about, uh, I had some weird stuff in there, I tried a bunch of different things, and at no point did I consider a 1-1 goal bat line, but it's so, so good, because 130 HP Pokemon, now you kill them, uh, my phone is going off like crazy, I'm just gonna throw it to the side, but 130 HP Pokemon, now you kill them, you can swoop across to still kill them, you can use Zubat's attack to still kill them, um, I, am, I was so pissed I didn't come up with this myself, to be completely honest. Uh, it makes way more sense than Giovanni, it makes way more sense than even Cabalion does. Yeah. So, I don't that was the coolest thing about the list for me, was the one goal bat line. Um, on top of that, yeah, less parallel focused, more Silent Lab focused. Like I said, I think Silent Lab is was the way to go for this tournament, and going forward is still the way to go. Uh, if you can play a deck that can get away with a high counter silent lap, go for it, because that is just so powerful, especially turn one, uh, shutting off your opponent's hoopas and stuff like that, with things like Rayquaza and Gardevoir getting so big, especially as a result of this tournament. Uh, Magearna, I think, will pick up a bit. I know Robin Schultz, who played Giratina Garbodor in this top eight, um, the guy who came up with the deck and has already made top eight here, top eight at Spiel, he's off to a fantastic start this season. Um, shout out to him, of course. I believe he didn't play Magirna in this list, and he said he would put it back in because of Jirachi being in the Rayquaza list. And yeah, that makes more sense. But of course, Silent Lab shuts off the Magirna, so you can keep going as you were. Um, but of course, you can't play Silent Lab because Giratina is locking them out. I don't know. We'll work on this. We'll work on it. But I think Silent Lab is definitely the way to go. I think it's just it's so inherently powerful at the moment, and it's the one of the easiest ways to item lock, ability lock, uh, without having to commit like a supporter or a 2-2 Garbodor line, you know? Anywho. What else we got? So that was the Scizor list. Gyarados <coughs> also made top 8. 
Uh, I'm really surprised to see Gyarados is not more popular than it is. It's a super, super easy deck to find a list for. Okay, we've seen the lists all over the place with the Two Shame and the Meowstic, with the Four Buddy Buddy Rescue, things like that. It, the list is everywhere. If you want to find a good Gyarados list, it's not that difficult to find. If you want to pick up the cards, they're super cheap. Like, Meowstic EX is like three quid. I bought one myself like a month ago. It was, I think the postage cost more than the card did. But. It was like, it's like, I really don't get why it's so unpopular. Um, Andrew Emerson was the one piloting, piloting this. I believe he was top after day one Swiss and then just played against Giratina in top eight. And obviously you're not going to win that because you run four double colors and that's it. Uh, I don't know what Gyarados' plan is, like Ranger and Prey, maybe. I don't know. I'm really surprised this isn't more popular than it is. Like, it's not in the top 32 at all, apart from just here. Um, it's an extremely powerful deck. It hits stupid big numbers with a non EX. You've got an awful lot of HP on your Gyarados. You've got that lovely Theta double trait, um, which means you can attach two tools to it. Not a lot of the lists that are doing well are taking advantage of this, but it gives you the option to run things like Clef Geese and Double Bursting Balloon if you feel that way inclined. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm really surprised to see it not doing better than it's currently doing. Um, even after these consistently great results that it keeps pumping out, so I still don't know if it's worth teching against. Even it's easy enough to tech against, like one Spinda, and you could beat this thing. Like probably no problem. Um, Spinda, of course, does ten damage to everything on your opponent's side of the board, just for like a colorless energy. Like even just something like that will take like two or three KOs in a single turn and set your opponent back super far. Um, so. But I just, I, I just don't know why it's more people are playing this. I just don't know why this isn't being considered a top tier archetype. It's mind boggling to me. Uh, it also made top four. I believe Steven Erickson played it at the League Cup, um, the next day as well. So it's getting the results. It's just like if you look further down the board, it's like no one else was playing this. I don't, I don't get it. I really don't get it. Um, and yeah, that's all of the top eight decks that I've just gone through myself. Um, what didn't make top eight? was Dark Tina was like I said nowhere I've made this point before but this is a very American deck uh, over in Europe we just don't play that anywhere near as much and hey it shows um, Greninja as well was actually quite present in top 32 I think I made this point already but this is a, this is scary I don't want to see Greninja doing well I make a lot of decks that I think oh this is good it loses to Greninja but it's good um, I really don't want to see Greninja doing well I hate playing against it um, so yeah, but it's, like I said, Garbodor is kind of dropping off a bit, so that leaves the space for Greninja to re-enter the fray. Dark Ritina is generally really good against Gear against Greninja as well, because of course it runs Garbodor, and the Dark Rides are very difficult to KO in one hit, and they can KO everything on the Greninja side of the field, and uh, there is no Dark Tina con to contest with. I think this is definitely one of those things that maybe if we had gone to a top 8, a top 32, we would have probably seen a Greninja in the top 8. And to me, that's terrifying. I really hope it doesn't pick up any more popularity, because I really hate that thing. Um, yeah, I think that's going to do it. I think that covers everything I wanted to talk about about this um, past tournament. I also want to give a quick shout out to a guy called Adam Mann, who I played on the day, um, and he recognized me from my YouTube channel, so thank you so much. Uh, that was really cool, actually. That was a nice little confident boost. So, yeah. Any other shoutouts I wanted to give? I don't think so. I think I'm all good. Yeah, like I said, I'm going to link in the description to Tomato's video on the Sizzle List because it's a fantastic watch. Also going to link to Mudkip Shore where all these results are because just Mudkip Shore is great. It's like our equivalent of the Charizard Lounge and I would not be able to see results a moment after they appear without it. So, thank you, David Hockman, for maintaining that website. Anywho, next week. Um, I don't know what day it's going to be next week that I do the podcast. There will be deck analysis. The Let's Play is coming back. Don't worry, guys. Let's Play is coming back. I do intend to finish that. Um, it was all just part of the channel hiatus. I'm going to have a deck analysis and the Let's Play up this week. I don't know what deck. It'll either be Raticate Break or Pidgeot. Depends on which list I sort of get more confident with between now and then. I don't know what day they'll. It'll be sometime midweek. Uh, then at the weekend, of course, we'll have the Let's Play next week. Then I'll have the deck analysis of whichever one I didn't do, either Raticate or Pidgeot, I'm not sure. Um, a Let's Play episode on the weekend, as always. And probably a Pokemon Sun and Moon review, because that's coming out on Friday. And I really want to talk about it, because it's probably a great game. 
Dortmund regionals will then be the week after that, so I can recap that. Um, yeah, we got a lot of things planned. We got a lot of work to do, and I look forward to getting it all done. Thank you so much for watching. We can find me on facebook.com slash whoopercast, youtube.com slash whoopercast. If you're watching from SoundCloud, uh, soundcloud.com slash whoopercast as well. Tune in and Stitcher, we're on there too. Leave a like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff if you enjoyed, and I will see you next time.